All right, it is seven o'clock, so we will go ahead and get things started. Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Virginia Howell. I am the director at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking, and I am so glad to have all of you here for our presentation tonight with Dr. Nazreen Khan. She's going to be talking about stories of paper innovation. And Nazarene is also serving as a postdoctoral fellow at the Paper Museum this year. We're delighted to have her. She has been doing a lot of work uh, in terms of combining the science and the research that are happening, not only in the Renewable Bioproducts Institute, which is our parent organization, but helping us to understand uh, exactly what's going on with the science of paper. Uh, a lot of what the museum does really focuses on the past of paper making, um, art that is done with paper and paper making. So we've not done as much with the scientific aspects of paper. So we're really excited to have Nazarene providing us with um, expertise and helping us translate these concepts into terms that those of us who haven't had a science class in 20 years uh, helps us to understand what's going on. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Just a little bit of business before we dive into the presentation. If you have not had the opportunity to visit the museum, we do have an excellent exhibit up right now. It is called When Print Meets Paper, and it features the artwork of four artists who um, are utilizing paper, handmade paper that they have made, and then they are printing on it and exploring how these two practices can be combined together. And that exhibit is going to be up until April 21st. So you've got uh, 10 more days to check it out. And um, with that, I'm going to be turning it over to Nazreen in just a moment. Um, as I said before, Nazreen is our postdoctoral fellow at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking, and she is going to be presenting on um, some of the advances in science and papermaking. So take it away, Nazreen. Thank you. So I am Nazreen Khan, and I'm here with the museum to talk to you about stories of paper innovation. So a little bit about me, like Virginia said, I am postdoc at the museum. I got my PhD in material science and engineering at Georgia Tech uh, last year. Um, I'm also doing this tech to teaching program uh, and this lecture is part of that. So there's a short survey at the end. I'd really appreciate it um, if I could get your feedback on how um, I taught and gave this lecture today. Um, I also have a podcast that I started with um, one of my lab mates during my PhD. It's on um, material science and sustainability. So if you want to learn more uh, about those topics, uh, please feel free to check us out. And so the museum's mission is to collect, preserve, increase, disseminate knowledge about papermaking, past, present, and future. So in this talk, you will hear more about how paper enabled innovation uh, and how scientific tools teach us about the past, specifically with conservation of Chinese woodblocks in our museum. And I'm also going to talk about innovation in cellul cellulose-based nanomaterials, um, what's happening now and what's expected to happen in the future. I'll also talk a little bit about the history of, of those materials and where it's going in consumer products. So this talk will be interactive. Um, so I'm gonna start off with a poll. How does paper impact your life? So what types of paper did you use today? So I'll give you a few minutes or a few seconds to respond. All right, let's see, let's see what we've got. Okay, so a lot of people have used multiple of these paper-based products today. Um, toilet paper, 11 out of 11, um, cardboard, paper towels, all of these things um, are um, part of people's lives, which is really cool. And so paper impacts our lives every day. So we can think about if you didn't have paper, what could you use instead? What would life be like without all of these different paper products that you use? And so there was a time where there was no paper. Um, and because paper is so ubiquitous in our lives, we tend to take it for granted, but paper is an, an innovation. It was invented 
um, two centuries ago in around 100 AD, and it was kept as a trade secret in China for hundreds of years. So they knew it was really important. They really didn't want to share this technology with other people. It took about a century after it was invented to even get to Europe. And so paper in China was used for many applications, things like packaging items such as medicine, wrapping paper for wrapping parcels of tea, hats, sheets, clothing, curtains, screens, money, in many different ways, and in many of the ways we still use it today. And because it impacts our lives in so many ways, um, I don't know how to put this, but paper is kind of a big deal. And it's also a big deal because it enabled other innovation. So for example, printing. So why do we print? And how do we print? So in China, paper was printed on um, for a variety of reasons to disseminate information about literature, culture, art, documentation for scholarly and religious and governmental texts. These are examples of um, some of the paper that's printed on and the text uh, documents we have in our museum today. And this is what you needed to actually print. So at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking, we hold a collection of woodblocks and woodblock prints from the 19th and 20th century from China and Japan. They were collected by our museum's founder, Dard Hunter, in his travels in East Asia in the 1920s and 1930s. So the earliest block printing in China were with woodblocks. And in China, the invention of movable type was quite innovative. Um, and this happened hundreds of years before it came to the West even. So again, in terms of creating more innovation, uh, Chinese woodblocks were required precise tools to be able to make them. So this is an example of one of the tools. You can see that at the tip of the tool, it's less than a millimeter. So you had really fine tools to get to, to, get to and make these really precise um, characters in the woodblocks. Um, it also led to innovations of how to make inks. So a lot of pigments and dyes were used and developed to make inks. Red inks could include pigments such as cinnabar, red lead, or iron. Black inks could include carbon black or lead sulfide. And so there is a widespread use of cinnabar in Chinese colorants. Um, so Anne, who is our volunteer book and paper conservator, suspected that our red woodblocks may contain cinnabar. And that is a problem because cinnabar is mercury sulfide. We know that mercury sulfide is hazardous when inhaled um, or has contact with skin in sufficient quantities. So this might be a problem. So did people in the 18th and 19th century know that mercury was poisonous? Um, raise your hand if you think that they didn't know. Yeah, so they probably didn't know, they didn't know. Um, they used cinnabar because it was available and gave these really beautiful, bright, long lasting red colors. We know now that it is heart hazardous in certain quantities. So we wanna know, do our wood blocks contain cinnabar? And what can we do to find out if our historic objects have mercury? So we reached out to our friends at the Georgia Tech Material Characterization Facility and we used some advanced techniques. Um, the specific technique we used was X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. It's an analytical technique that uses X-rays to identify elements um, and it creates maps of the different elements that are in a surface or over surface and within a micrometer deep of the object. So what it does is it hits X-rays to the material and then the material releases um, other characteristic x-rays specific to the element. Um, it's a great tool because it's not destructive, so it doesn't harm the object. Um, and you can even look at larger samples. So that is what we did. And can, can anyone give me predictions of whether you think there is or isn't mercury? So raise your hand if you think we did in fact have mercury. Okay, so lots of yeses to there being mercury in our wood box. And you guys are correct. 
So we looked at many different spots on our wood blocks, and we saw that not only was there mercury, but there was also lead. So this is an example of the spectra showing that we have both mercury and lead in the inks in our wood blocks. So likely what we have is cinnabar and red lead. But we also have um, black pigment wood blocks as well. And luckily these were not hazardous. We didn't find any uh, questionable elements or elements that are concerning, um, but we did find a lot of common pigments such as and minerals such as aluminum, silicon, iron. And so that's likely what's coloring our black wood. Um, wood blocks. So this changed how we take care of our wood blocks and how we handle them. So we put them, wrap them in archival um, paper and then put them in archival boxes. And we changed our procedures in terms of how we handle them um, with gloves and in well ventilated areas because um, in large quantities, these are um, those elements, mercury and lead are hazardous. Um, Luckily, they were in very low quantities for the wood blocks but we have, but out of abundance of caution, wanted to make sure that both the objects and the people who are in contact with them are um, safe. And we also did digital micros microscopy, and this gave us a closer look at what is in these wood blocks. So like I mentioned before, some of these tools have points that are smaller than one millimeter or so, really, really small areas. And so we looked at microscopy to see what's going on in them. And we were surprised to find a few unexpected things. We saw that there was some hair embedded in the wood block. Um, it was more coarse. And so we suspect that this might be animal hair, um, potentially used in a brush to brush on the inks from that time. We also saw in the small grooves in the characters that there were fibers, which we think are paper fibers from the paper that was printed on. And so that's interesting because there's this potential to do further research where we could analyze maybe some of the hair or the fibers to understand more about these materials and what was happening and what was available in that time period in that part of the world. Um, and some, the digital microscopy can also enable accessibility. This microscope was cool because it has this Z stacking capability, which allows you to recreate sort of the depth as well. And so here you can see a 3D rendering of some of the characters. And this would be nice because we could potentially use this to 3D print the characters and recreate the artifacts um, to make it more accessible to potentially the visually impaired and also people can come and actually physically handle a recreation of, of the objects when they can't handle it themselves. And so talk a little bit, I'm gonna talk more about the present of paper. So I told you that paper is really important technologically. So I didn't say what paper is exactly. So what three things do you think um, we need to make paper? And we have launched a poll where you can uh, do a short answer of that. And while y'all are answering that poll, um, I have included a link to an article that Nazreen wrote about the analytical, te analytical techniques that she just shared with you. So if you want to find out some more information about what we were doing and why we were doing it, there is a link to an article about that in the chat. All right, let's see what we've got. Let's see the answers. Actually, Thanks. I've been able to pull out the view details on it. And it's uh, cellulose, fiber, water, and a mold with a question mark. Water, fiber, and tools. We've got some more uh, answers. Cellulose, water, and pressure in. Cellulose and heat. Water, wood, and fibers. Fiber and a binder, wood, cellulose, and water, wood, waters, or chemical solution, and time, plants, water, and a mystery item to be named at a later date. Okay. Great. And you guys are right on the money because at minimum, you need 
a plant source, a water source, and the tools to make it. Whether this was in the past or the present, those were the minimum three things you needed to make paper. But the type of paper matters and the qualities you need um, dictate what additional things you might add. So what is the most important quality of the paper that you use? So there were many examples of types of paper that you use every day. What do you find personally is the most important thing about paper? So we've got strength, printability, appearance. It depends. And so uh, for those who said it depends, in terms of designing products, the quality does depend on the application. So for cardboard or for packaging, it is strength. It's really important to have strong paper and cardboard. Um, so these are objects in our collection. Um, they look like normal everyday objects and uh, cartons or cardboard that you would use, but these are actually test specimens. So this is a box that had been stressed, had stuff on top of it um, for 74 days before it buckled, so before it collapsed. So it was a great cardboard, really strong. It lasted for 74 days before it failed. This is um, cardboard with fluting, and usually the fluting is more cardboard, but in this case, they actually used metal because they wanted to have a really reinforced, strong cardboard box. This is a recycled newspaper um, fruit tray. And to make this strong, they used wet strength chemical additive. So in this case, instead of using um, uh, something like steel or adding some sort of stronger material, they use wet strength chemicals um, to help keep it strong. And so additives can help achieve different qualities. Um, you can have things like minerals, chemicals, um, polymers to get what you want. And so this could be stronger if you want a cardboard box, maybe brighter if you're thinking about printability and printing. Um, you, can, you might also want to consider how can you make your paper cheaper or sustainable and that'll drive some of the things you add to it. So we're going to talk more about the present and future and talking about new additives coming up in this area. So the museum is part of the Renewable Bioproducts Institute. This is an interdisciplinary research institute at Georgia Tech, and it's really focused on innovation um, in terms of converting biomass into value-added products, developing advanced chemical and bio-based technologies, and advancing um, paper-related manufacturing processes um, with a focus on circular materials, bio-industrial manufacturing, and paper packaging and tissue. So, but like, what does all of that mean? Specifically, how can we convert biomass, such as trees, into value-added products in novel ways? So we can rethink the scale of uh, the material that we use. So we know how to make things out of trees. Um, we get fibers that we make um, paper with um, from macrofibrils. We do can get the cellulose molecules and make a lot of things out of that as well. Um, but there's this area in between uh, microfibrils and nanofibrils that if we can extract, we can do some really interesting things with. And so the fiber um, that we use for paper can again be broken down into microfibrils. They can also be further broken down into nanofibrils and then nanocrystals. And these are really, really small. They're smaller than red blood cells can be smaller than bacteria, and the nanocrystals can be even smaller than viruses. And so this enables us to do some really interesting things because these are nanomaterials. And one of those things are replacements for plastic. So if they can behave like plastic without being fossil fuel based. So you can 3D print with them, you can create these clear plastic looking films but both this film and this paper are made of cellulose. Um, the difference being that this is in the nano scale and this is in the larger micron scale. You can also do things like make glitter, but instead of glitter, which is fossil fuel based making microplastics, 
you have glitter essentially made of cellulose, which is biodegradable. Okay, so before we talk more about these new materials and how they can replace different things, um, let's talk about the history of these materials. So when were these first discovered and what has happened since? The first nanofibers were actually made from bacteria. So bacteria can ferment sugars and make cellulose fibers out of them. And these fibers are at the nanoscale. It was report, supposedly accidentally discovered as early as in the 1819 um, in the Philippines. So um, the story goes that pineapple peels were used as a culture medium to grow cellulose produced from bacteria. Um, later in the Philippines, they developed what is called nata de coco, which is this jelly-like food produced from fermenting coconut water. And so this became a big, bigger industry in the 1970s and later on producing this food that is essentially cellulose fibers made from bacteria. The first time it was actually scientifically studied and confirmed that bacteria could make cellulose nanofibers was in 1886 um, by a man named A.J. Brown from the UK. He noticed that bacteria formed what is this like tough gelatinous film. It was jelly-like, it was translucent, and he called it a vinegar plant. Um, there was no name for it, so he called it that. And he was able to replicate um, this vinegar plant with many different types of media with his bacteria. So he used vinegar, red wine, yeast, and water. And he did a number of scientific studies to confirm that this gel was actually cellulose. And so um, it's quote, this analysis together with the reactions mentioned, leaves no doubt that the membrane of the vinegar plant is cellulose, like that of cotton wool. And because it reminded him of cotton wool and it, because it was cellulose, he coined this bacteria, bacterium xylenum, where xylenum comes from the Latin word for cotton. And so this is a picture from another um, paper showing the bacteria that is able to form these cellulose fibers. Um, and over time, more advanced techniques came around and researchers in the 1930s and 40s were able to further confirm with x-rays and microscopy that these five, that this bacteria was able to make um, cellulose fibers. So these are electron microscope images um, from a paper in 1949 um, from the National Institute of Health actually that confirmed that the bacteria was making these fibrils or these fibers that had the same diameter in terms of nanometers or angstroms, um, similar to that of cellulose from plants. So they confirmed that the plants and the bacteria were making fibers at the nanoscale. And so in comparing bacterial versus plant cellulose, there are some advantages and disadvantages as we're thinking ahead about making consumer products. Um, the advantage to bacterial cellulose is its high purity cellulose fibers. So the bacteria is taking the sugars and making it in straight into the cellulose fibers. If you use plants or wood, there's all these additional parts of the plant like lignin, um, hemicelluloses, that you have to then try to remove. Um, but with bacteria, that's not an issue. And because they are churning out these really long fibers, they tend to have these really high aspect ratios, which means that if fibers are really, really long compared to how thin they are in diameter. And they can form these films in many different shapes. And they also have high water content, which is really useful for things like making products that you could use for wound healing for burns, for example. The disadvantages are wood or plant fibers are much more ubiquitous throughout the world. So you can, if you can make nanomaterials from wood and other fibers, that would be much more better or much better in terms of scale. And so most bacterial cellulose even now is produced in small scales. So a lot of the research right now is going into how can we mass produce this at something that's greater than a pilot or a lab scale. And so a lot of the research is looking at um, creating bioreactors to be able to do that. But we do know that um, bacterial cellulose has been made from coco donata, 
and um, other sources such as um, actually SCOBY from Kombucha. So there are a few startup companies like um, Bucha Bio who are using this material um, from SCOBY from Kombucha and turning that into vegan leather. So there is a lot of work that's going on to making bacterial cellulose more mass producible. Mass producible. Um, but for a long time and still today, getting the scale in terms of bacterial, bacterial cellulose is difficult. So if we were able to extract cellulose microfibers or cellulose nanofibers from wood, that would be a huge deal. Um, and this happened first in 1977 where a researcher from a company called ITT Rainier um, was using a milk homogenizer to make edible breakfast sausages out of cow hides. So a homogenizer is what it sounds like. It makes things more homogeneous. Um, so it takes, in the case of milk, um, large particles of milk and breaks it into smaller particles that are more homogeneous. So you get a nice smooth blend of milk. And so he was, doing that and also successful with making sausage casings from cow hides. So he decided to run chopped pulp fibers through the high pressure milk homogenizer too. So he ran it through the homogenizer and he noticed that with enough pressure, the uh, pulp fibers went through a phase change. So they went from this white opaque pulp into more of a translucent clear gel. And um, they looked at it under a microscope and so this is an image of um, one of the first microscope images of cellulose nanofibers made from trees um, in a homogenizer. And this was a really big deal. This invention was huge because as I mentioned, um, we didn't have a method to produce these nano or microfibers at any sort of reasonable scale to be useful. Um, and so this invention really started off um, a new industry um, and a new form of cellulose. And these um, uh, three researchers, Turbach, Snyder, and Sandberg, um, coined this term microfibrillated cellulose and my, um, nanofibrillated cellulose, uh, which is used today to describe these materials. And um, Turbach, Dr. Turbach, is a part of Georgia Tech history. The museum is in Georgia Tech. He got his PhD at Georgia Tech in chemistry. And at the time this paper was published, he was um, the director of the School of Polymers and Textiles Engineering, which is now Material Science and Engineering, which is where I got my degree from. So um, it's a nice connection there. Um, and this is a picture of Dr. Turbach and his grandson in the Georgia Tech colors. So I showed you some of the images and some of the things they did to be able to make these materials. What do you think, once they had the materials that they made, um, what do you think can be made of CNFs? I mentioned plastic, but there's lots of other things. So I'd love to hear what you guys think. So the details are, um, we got six answers. Um, takeout containers. Um, Concerned that it could be another threat to trees, um, nose pore strips, fabrics, fabric and pipes, and the wound care looks really promising. Those are all wonderful answers. Um, and you are correct in many, many ways, pretty much all, all the ways. Um, but at the time of this paper, the main thing they um, used it for after they discovered they could make it was food. Um, so surprisingly, they used it to make food. In addition to the scientific studies that they did on the material, they outlined recipes for no calorie salad dressing, um, additives for making ground beef and cake frosting, um, because this material has a really cool consistency and viscosity. Um, so you can get really cool textures out of it, but also because cellulose isn't digestible um, by the body, it just passes through. So you can get this really nice um, texture without adding calories to um, the foods that you're making. So they were using it for food, um, which kind of makes sense because 
they were using a milk homogenizer. And so they were trying to create another additive that they could use in food. But they also suggested a lot of other things, some of which you guys had um, also suggested. So cosmetics, paints, paper, and non-woven textiles, um, even things like in drilling muds and packer fluids in oil field operations and medical gels for coating burns as well. Um, and how what has been developed by now. Um, so those were their suggestions when they first discovered this material. And now most of those things, actually all of those things have been researched and started to be developed. So these are some of the things that have been put into consumer products. Um, most of this research is, and most of this work is out of Japan. So Japan is leading a lot of this innovation in terms of incorporating these materials into different consumer products. So we've got ink, um, uh, diapers, um, even running shoes, foods, like I mentioned, electronics, um, paper and food packaging is another really important one. Um, like I said before, you can replace plastic um, potentially with these materials. And so a lot of the food packaging has a layer of plastic. So if you um, change that to the cellulose nanomaterials, you can make recycling a little bit easier and make the overall product a little bit more um, sustainable and circular. And so a lot of things um, these materials can go into. And why can these materials go into so many different things? Um, and it's it's because they're really unique um, due to their size. They're in the nano scale and you put to their morphology, so they can be really, really fibrillated, form these networks, or they can be crystalline, so they act like little crystals. Um, so you can do a lot of things with both their size, their morphology, and their chemistry. So because they're made of cellulose, you can do, um, you can change some of the chemistry on the cellulose to be able to give you other additional properties. Um, and they're lightweight while still being strong. Um, they have high surface area. They, in liquid, they can self-assemble um, the crystals specifically to act like liquid crystals, which are sometimes used in like uh, displays like uh, monitors. And again, like in terms of food, they can act like a gel, um, do a lot of great things. But the best part is they are sustainable because they are from renewable sources um, and they can be biodegradable as well. And so they're used as additives, um, but specifically uh, they have the potential to be really high strength additive. So if you compare them to other materials that you may have heard of like Kevlar, carbon fiber, carbon nanotubes, um, for their density, um, they have similar strength. So these are all different strength values. They're on the same magnitude as these other types of materials, um, specifically the crystalline cellulose. Um, but again, the advantage is these are renewable resources, um, which is fantastic in terms of sustainability um, in the future. And so how far have we come? So this is uh, the world production capacity of different types of cellulose nanomaterials. Um, by now, we there are thousands of research papers, hundreds if not thousands of patents, and numerous startup companies and companies developing these materials. So in 2019, the reported capacity is about 15,000 tons per year globally. But if we compare that to how much paper and paper board is produced in 2019, um, it's still really small. So about 400 million metric tons of paper and paper board were produced in 2019. So in comparison, the 15,000 tons is quite small. And that's because this industry is still developing. They're still looking at how to take pilot plants and mass um, and produce um, large facilities to be able to make these materials. So a very still developing industry right now. And so in the current and near term future, um, these are appearing in paper, packaging, um, in construction materials. In the future, they're hopefully replaced by um, replace plastic. So you have bioplastics, They'll be in electronics um, and also in 
um, medicine and bioengineering applications as well. Um, and this is a prediction about um, how much value in terms of millions of dollars of euro, specifically in um, Finland, which is a top producer of forest-based products um, with just the current products, paper, um, cardboard, et cetera, the value of production will kind of plateau as it goes into the next several decades. But as you increase these new cellulose nanomaterials, there's, you're gonna have a huge uptake in the value of production as more and more things are made with these uh, materials um, over time. So we expect that in the next several decades, a lot of the things that we use um, will have more of these cellulose nanomaterials. Um, so I just wanted to leave off with something that's very important to me, sustainability. Um, and what's cool about paper is paper has the highest recycling rate in the United States of any other material. So um, for all of the waste that's sent to a municipal system, so that's recycled landfilled, most of it, two thirds of that is actually being recycled. So you have 67% of the paper um, that is thrown away or recycled is actually recycled. If you compare that to other materials, um, it's way, way better. So plastic is pretty terrible. Metals are like 34%, um, glass, electronics. They're much lower than the recycling rates of paper. And that's because people know what to do with paper when they're done using it. And also there are the systems in place to recycle them. Um, but unlike these other materials, Paper, if you make them from virgin sources in the United States, um, virgin paper, um, virgin um, trees are sustainably sourced. So cutting down trees um, is not an issue because it is all sustainably produced, which is a common misconception. Whereas metals and electronics, if you're using virgin materials, those are mined and those are terrible for the environment. So just a PSA, please recycle your plastics, your metal, electronics, glass um, as well. Um, so keep recycling paper because that's great, um, but they do, it does come from sustainable sources, um, unlike some of these other things if you don't recycle. But the cool thing about the cellulose nanomaterials is because they're so small, you can recycle um, waste that wouldn't have otherwise been recycled um, in new ways. So you can increase that 67% to even higher if you're recycling them into cellulose nanomaterials. And so people have done lots of research to produce these materials from different manufacturing waste, agricultural waste, and consumer municipal waste as well. So like tea bags, cartons, cardboard, um, a whole bunch of things. So being able to create cellulose na nanomaterials is also great for sustainability because you can now take sources um, that would have just been wasted um, and make these really interesting materials with them as well. So in summary, I talked about how paper is and continues to be a technological innovation. Um, it has enabled innovation of other technologies and scientific tools um, like x-rays um, help us learn more about paper, um, their materials, and artifacts in museums. Um, cellulose nanomaterials are new class of materials that will become part of our everyday lives in the future. And um, hopefully in the near future, we will have a new paper science and technology exhibit where you can learn more about this, the, these and other topics related to paper science and technology. Um, so thank you. There is a brief survey, if you all wouldn't mind, um, it's a short like three question survey on how this lecture went. I would really appreciate some feedback so we can do more lectures for you all um, in the future. So I will just leave like three minutes, two or three minutes for you all to do that. And Virginia will drop the link in um, the chat as well. Yes, the link is in the chat. Please do take the time to go ahead and fill out that survey. Um, it's really important for us to be able to get the feedback and um, we can leave the, the QR code up on the screen for a little bit. 
Um, if folks have any questions at this time, if you want to drop them into the chat, you are welcome to do that. Um, thank you so much, Nazarene. Um, a couple of questions that I have. Um, you've spent a lot of time um, working with the circular economy, and you mentioned it a couple of times within your talk. Can you give us a very brief um, elevator summary of what that means? Um, yeah, so circular economy essentially means how can we ensure that the materials and the products that we're making um, can have the highest value for the longest amount of time. And so we want to be able to keep reusing materials and reusing products as much as possible before we have to throw them away. So for things that are made of metals that are mined, it's better to reuse them, repurpose them, repair them um, before you have to recycle or get rid of them. Um, for things like um, uh, paper or paper-based products, um, you can try to recycle them as much as possible. And when you can no longer recycle them, you can use them for things like energy. So the idea is to try to keep using materials, especially finite materials, um, as much as possible before you have to get rid of them at all. Um, and so this is really important because I think America um, consumes in terms of like amount of money spent on products way more than every other country in the world. And they also um, send a lot of that um, material and products to landfills. So it's really important to try to be able to get that back. Um, so we have more, so we can essentially live in the future. So there's resources for people in the future as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, all right. I think we've given folks time to be able to get to the survey and we will also send out a link to the survey um, tomorrow. If you didn't get a chance to complete it, um, we'll send that out as well. And uh, Nazarene, if you want to stop sharing. Sure. I just wanted to um, uh, give out oh, yes. uh, some shout outs, um, acknowledgement to my funding source, um, the Georgia Tech Office of Ex Executive Vice President of Research, um, where we're trying to incorporate more STEM with art to do STEAM. Um, the Renewable Bioproducts Institute, um, the other folks at Georgia Tech, the museum staff, including Virginia, the volunteers and volunteers and students by name. And <laughs> yes. um, thanks again, <laughs> want to contact us. So thank you very, very much. That was um, fascinating. And even though I'd, I'd gotten to hear a, a practice of it, it was great seeing the additional things that you added into the talk. Um, I, I have another question. Hopefully it's not a, a stumper. Um, what are you, I, th I think you maybe already answered it. What are you most excited about with the possibilities of C and Fs? Um, I think for me, it's the replacing plastic, the fossil fuel based plastics. I think that's a really, really important step for sustainability. And what I've heard from other researchers as well, um, especially from. <laughs> yes, he, he had to help uh, too. <laughs> all, um, what I've heard from other researchers is they think the fossil fuel based plastics are really important, like you need them. Um, so before you start banning them, you need to have other materials in place that can replace them. So um, that that potential, I think, is really important. Excellent. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you again, and hope thank to see you, you at more programs.